El Rey tequila. <laughs> El Rey tequila, El Rey shot glasses. Oh, man, excellent. <laughs> Box is the fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark. And we're back at the director's chair with Quentin Tarantino, volume two. Here we go. Percent. You used your influence right away to champion forgotten filmmakers and films. Uh, you created a label called Rolling Thunder. What was, what was uh, the idea behind that? Well, Rolling Thunder was the fact that it's like I was going on the film festival circuit, so I was seeing all these different movies. And finally I said, Harry, why don't you give me my own label with like a little tiny budget and just let me buy what, what I want to buy. And uh, we can release it. It wasn't about money, it was just about doing it. And so the first movie that uh, I chose was Wong Kar Wai's Chunking Express. It had been around for five years. Nobody wanted it. It was already on video in, you know, like in the Chinatown market. And then like we made like almost every top 10 list that year right. with Chunking and set up Wong Kar Wai as an art house darling from that point on. But I was also picking up older movies trying to present them in a different light. I was a big Jack Hill fan, and so we released uh, uh, Switchblade Sisters because I saw how well it played with audiences. Frankly, I mean, the idea I had for Rolling Thunder as this film distribution label has finally found its perfect home as an entire cable channel, all right, showing uh, uh, the movies you guys show. El Rey Network Grindhouse Fridays presents Five Fingers of Death. Switchblade Sisters, Rolling Thunder. As if you made that network just for me and me alone. <laughs> well, that's one thing you've always been fantastic about is just curating the content. El Rey's like that cool friend, yeah. like you yeah. are to me, who says, this is what you should see because, yeah. and this is the reason, and this is why you're watching it. You'll be very pleased to know Gordon Lou Day was our biggest ratings day of all time. Oh, man. <laughs> that was so cool you had Gordon Lou Day when it was like, look, oh my God, like four of them in a row all Sunday. How awesome! I who would ever have thought you would turn on the television and have a you know, professionally done Gordon Lou Day? I can program a Gordon Lou Day on my VCR. Yeah. <laughs> but to see it HD and, yeah. and project it that way, I mean, these are the movies you usually had to scrounge to find, or you'd have to yeah. know somebody like you to see them, stringing them up in 16 millimeter. And now here it is; you can see it. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> when you had to follow up Pulp Fiction. It overperformed. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, was it harder to get the next thing going? How did you get past that? Because I get a lot of people who come to me and they and they're like, I did a video that I put on YouTube and it's got 50 million hits, and now I don't know how to follow that up. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, like, yeah. and I tell them your stories. Like, well, Quentin did Pulp Fiction. He didn't know that was coming. Mm -hmm. He just kept going, mm -hmm. and then and you break through. You got to put yourself in the mindset. Where was I when I made that video? I wasn't thinking about 50 million hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just doing what I do. And if you're trying to think about 50 million hits, well, you're just going to be doing sequels. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to get back into the headspace you were at where you created that. Yeah. How did you get back into the headspace? And was it just, I know you were struggling with the fact that people are expecting Pulp Fiction 2. And if I don't make Pulp Fiction 2, they're going to be disappointed. So I'm like. Yeah, but they're never going to like Pulp Fiction 2. Yeah, so they're never <laughs> going to like Pulp Fiction 2. So what do I do? How did you get past that? I actually, it was such a big success. I have to go underneath. Right. Let me do a more mature film. Let me do a more character-based film. Let me um, let me do a movie that people would expect from me when I was 45. If you had the chance to walk away with a half million dollars, would you take it? I had had the rights to some Elmore Leonard books, and one of them was Rum Punch, which became right. Jackie Brown. So I've been a big Elmer Leonard fan, and I saw where what I thought a lot of the Elmer Leonard adaptations go wrong is like, you know, it's his long dialogues, it's his weird digressions. Mm -hmm. When you try to just streamline that and like get to the point, well, now you lose every all the flavor that his books had. Right. I had the situation that I could, I could let them talk and let them be kind of shaggy dog stories. My only like structural things that I did that were different was changing Jackie, who was white, mm -hmm. to black. I just thought, who can be a woman in her like late 40s? You could tell she used to be really beautiful, still is, and you kind of feel she could handle anything. Like, why? That sounds like Pam Greer to me. Jackie Brown, if I have to tell you to shut up one more time, I'm going to shut you up. Booyah. Once I came up with the idea of casting Pam Greer, then it's like, oh, this is almost like a Pam Greer movie, but like a real Pam Greer movie, like a realistic Pam Greer movie where she actually holds a job as opposed to walking around with a sawed-off shotgun burning the ghetto down to the ground. 
and the the big diploma esque thing I threw into it was the whole money switch. It wasn't how he wrote it, but it was how I saw it in my head. Let's see the money switch happen from beginning to end with each of them. First it's Jackie's, then it's Lewis and Melanie's, and then it's Max's. By the time you see all three of them, you put it all together. <laughs> and those are just your instincts as a filmmaker, as a director. It literally was just how I saw it, what, what would, how it would be a cool way to do it the first time I read it, and when I read it a second time, it presented itself again. I've got footage of you, you know, on a panel from Toronto back in 1992, talking about that you were a writer-director, but you mainly you think of yourself as a director mm -hmm. who writes himself stuff to direct. But I don't want to write. I mean, I never consider myself a writer. I consider myself a director who writes stuff for himself to do. Do you still think of yourself that way? As proud as I am of my, my movies, I think writing has become more and more and more and more important to me. That first real flash of excitement is always when I'm writing something that should go this way and then all of a sudden inspiration happens and it goes somewhere else and I'm party to it. And I didn't expect it to happen, it just happened. Like, oh, well, that's real talent, that's what happens. That's, the real, that's what real writers do. In the case of like, say, Jackie Brown, and you know, I have to be careful how I say this because I absolutely love Jackie Brown. I, it's one of my best movies. It's, it's a, I think it's really, really terrific. I, and I have deep affection for it. Having said that, I don't think I was really put on earth to really adapt other people's novels. Mm -hmm. Now when you have so much material. Yeah, I think I was like, you know, I was here to, I was here to face the blank page and pull stuff out of me, find whatever story or genre I want to deal with and do just my own little version of it. But I was there to, you know, start from nothing. Right. And then at the end, have a finished movie, starting with that pen and that blank piece of paper. That is my progress. That is my, that is my journey. That's my heart of darkness. That's what I'm really here to do. The material you have sitting around this house when I walk around, the stuff you choose to throw out, most people would kill for, <laughs> myself included. I find scraps of handwritten paper that I would go, what is this? Oh, it's, a, it's an idea that's half-baked. And you start reading it and going, like, I could just Xerox this. I could make a whole series of films off these three pages. Remember Three Amigos when yeah. you're drinking the water? <laughs> the other guys are starving. Are like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't need that. In the desert like that, and the water's going in. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Seeing those scenes tossed out, there's more where that came from. <laughs> I have video of you from November 23rd, 1994, on the set of Four Rooms. He took me into a little room. He goes, can I read you um, part of this new script I'm writing called Kill Bill? And I sat down and I turned on my video camera. But which, by the way, that was like eight years before I did Kill Bill. And you started reading me the opening sequence of that movie. This is still black. Yeah. We fade up, a wall covered in red blood and brains. The camera pans off the wall to a young man, dressed in a tuxedo, lying dead on the floor, blown apart by a shotgun blast. And a woman's voice comes in. That's Tim, Arthur's best friend. We move to a plump, dead young woman in a frilly pink dress, wedding bouquet in her dead hand. That's my best friend from work, Erica. Ooh. We move past a bloody, dead little boy. I don't know who that is. Some little kid, I guess. I don't remember him being there. Oh, shit. We move over and see a pretty young woman wearing a white wedding gown, two bullet holes in her body, and one in her head. And we slowly zoom in to her dead-looking face. I laid in a coma for five years. When I woke, every emotion in me was dead. Every emotion that is, except one. Desire. The desire for revenge. Then we dissolve, because we're going into her dead looking face, we dissolve to a matching close-up of the young woman. Interior car moving, sunset. The young woman's behind the wheel of a big car, white wedding gown on. <laughs> Outrageous orange and red sunset process shot playing in the back window. She's talking into the camera. Wow. Did she put her dress back on? She's yeah. going after the kill. One man did all this to me. I've killed 18 men in the last week. Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Those 18 dead bodies were just 18 steps. Oh, wow. Steps I climbed to get to him. And to him is where I'm driving because there's no one left worth killing except him. The him I'm talking about's name is Bill. And when I get to where I'm going, about 20 minutes from now, 
I'm gonna kill Bill. <laughs> then, <laughs> then the music, then the you know, oh, you know, title oh, song shit. begins. <laughs> I was like Mickey in Rocky II. What are we waiting for? Yeah. Let's go start <laughs> shooting right now. I'll help you. Let's start shooting now. We could have taken that and shot that. It would have been fantastic. Now the movie you did was was even better, but that was still um, May fourth. 1999. It was uh, 6.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. so it was 4.30 your time, so it wasn't, you weren't up early, you're up late. Yeah. <laughs> I was up all night editing, and the phone rang, and I knew it was you, because mm -hmm. nobody else would call in the middle of the night. <laughs> I was about to call it, and you said, I got something to read you. Could you listen? That's the most thrilling call you could ever get, is Quentin calling you up <laughs> saying, can I read you something that I wrote? And you read me the opening <laughs> of um, Inglor what would become Inglorious Bastards back, you know, 11, 12 years before you made it. Um, is that part of your process to read stuff out to people? I never knew how I was supposed to react. Was I supposed to get feedback, or just I just enjoyed it so much yeah, that I, is it just do you do that a lot? Do you call a bunch yeah, of people it, to kind of hear it out it, loud for yourself? That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't, you know, <laughs> frankly, the only feedback I wanted is that's great. All right, uh, uh, <laughs> that's all. Uh, okay. You heard me laugh. That's my feedback. All right, but 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 the the truth of the matter is, I'm doing it for two reasons. One, I'm excited by it, so I want to share it. But the real reason I'm doing it is I could walk around my house and pace around and, 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 and act it out forever, all right? And I'll not, it won't help me any. Right. But if I read it to you, I'm hearing it through your ears, mm -hmm. all right? And so then I, I hear the bad notes. Right. I hear where I'm losing you. I hear where I got you. I hear the laughs. Uh, but you know, if I'm reading it to you, I'm I don't need your feedback because I'm you, you now, just heard it, yeah, and yeah. I'm hearing it through your ears. In 2001, you read me Kill Bill again, mm -hmm. uh, and you read me a, a new opening, a new uh, way of seeing it. We not only see she is a bride, but she's eight months pregnant. Oh, new one. Interior wedding chapel day, overhead shot. <laughs> we hear step, step, step till a man we haven't seen yet enters the shot, right next to the fallen bride. He lowers down next to her on his haunches, holding a white handkerchief with the name Bill sewn in the corner, and begins tenderly wiping away the blood from the young bride's face. While still in her close-up, the bride speaks for the first time in the picture. She looks up at the man standing over her and says, Bill, it's your baby. A beat after she says the word baby, we hear a bang! and the bride receives a bullet in the side of her head. Cut to Black Screen, the fourth film by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> How does that go about when you find, when you pick up the old version, do you, are you just at a different place and so you yeah. just think of a new way to do it? Or do, it, you, do you get, pre you see, don't seem to be precious about anything mm -hmm. like that. As good as it is, you don't go, wow, it's so good. Let, you have the confidence to say, I'm gonna completely start over. You know, by the time I was ready to do uh, Kill Bill again, well, now I had some different concerns. Now I had other things I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I still liked the idea. I still liked the idea of Uma. I still liked the idea of her being an assassin. Still liked the I the, still liked that whole revenge story structure. But now I had different f fish to fry. Right. I think the first story was more Femnikita-ish. So now, when you came back, you reimagined it, and what what made it become this thing? Where it was Yakuza? It was a samurai movie. It was anime. It was a spaghetti western. You know, I think at the time you said. All these tools that I've seen, and I, they're kind of in my toolbox. I can use any of them. Anything that's a visual language, whether it's from a comic book or a movie, I should be able to. Feel, I should feel free to use. It. That was my goal: kill Bill as one unit, not kill Bill one and two, but kill Bill as the way I wrote it and the way I shot it. Action! That's my vision to the utmost. That is the full-on Quentin movie, the full-on artistic experience of what I'm trying to offer, like distilled to just completely cinematic form. That became the new reason to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, along with like, you know, coming up with a, a ki killer vehicle for Uma, where I could like present her as, you know, I'm the grindhouse Joseph von Sternberg and she's my samurai sword wielding Marlena Dietrich. Mm -hmm. We actually kind of came up the, with the idea of more or less together in a bar in Santa Monica called the Daily Pint playing a shuffleboard. I come like, well, you're an assassin <laughs> and like you're fighting these guys and you're sort of a kill list. And each one of these guys represents a, a, almost a different genre in cinema. So when you go there, it's the kung fu movie and you know, this one's the black flotation movie and this one's maybe a redneck movie. It's strange being your friend 
sometimes because you get to know you just as the person that you are. You love cinema. You're, you're, you're a very loyal friend. You're, you're just the coolest guy on the earth. It's almost like knowing Clark Kent. And then you go a movie like that and you realize, oh, I forget, he's Superman also. <laughs> he can do, I forget he can do that too. Because you only make a movie every two or three years. And when you do it, and I, I turned to you during the premiere, I said, how the fuck did you do this? I have no idea how you did this. And you just went, well, come on, you know how I did it. It's like, no, I don't, I have no idea how you did, I think it's probably during the House of Blue Leaves sequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah! That was me throwing my hat into the action filmmaking ring in a big way. I'm a big fan of the action directors, and the first time I do it, I don't want to be a piker. I want to be as good as them. I mean, you were so painstaking in how you shot it. You even shot, you shot it in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. You, you did it the way they would do it. I mean, you spent, you were there a long time to get it exactly. I mean, I think you even would shoot in one direction, get a shot, turn around, shoot the next cut, then turn around. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, like, yeah like, that's, that's the Hong Kong way. Yeah. You know, the American way is like if Covered we're shooting, one direction. Yeah, we're shooting in this room, direction. we cut the room in half, and we do everything on this side mm -hmm. first, and then we do everything on that side. And that was kind of how we first started doing some of the action, some of it because that was the only way I knew how to do it, mm -hmm. the American way. That's not really their way because that's, you have to hold so much stuff in your head. Mm -hmm. You can't be organic. Right. And no one can ever keep all that stuff in their head or to make all the editing work. So what you do is like you're having a big old, big old Jackie Chan fight where he's taking on everybody in, in the tea house. You break everything down to two, three, or four fight moves. Do, 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 do. The doubles kind of just do it a bunch of times for you. And you kind of watch it from every kind of you know, different angles and then, and then I make my choice. I go, okay, so I'm thinking about uh, we get a camera here and maybe get one over his shoulder here and maybe one over here and then maybe another one. And then I go to Bob Richardson, the cameraman, and say, uh, so what do you think, Bob? And he goes, oh, I think that sounds good. Then maybe one over here. Okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> then I go to uh, Yuan Wuping, uh, the fight choreographer. What do you think? Oh, I like it, I like it, I like it. Maybe, you know, right now. <laughs> yeah, great. Now, we wouldn't put them all right there at the time. I was very specific about we weren't going to use two cameras. We would just do one camera. And so we would just kind of move them around, get all that. But what you also do is, say you've done four moves. That last move you did, that fourth move, well, that becomes the first move of the next three or four. So you can always cut it. Then also, because you're fighting in order, anything that happens to the costumes is fine. Right, right. Because it's happening it's on camera, continuity. and it's right there. Completely works in continuity. And also, you can change your mind about the fight. You know, you can like, oh, you know, we're on this class four too much. I'm getting sick of this place. All right, uh, let's go fight in that hallway. You're not trying to predict anything that's going to happen on the other side of the room four days from now or a week from now. Everything is kind of working because she's leaving a trail of death and destruction behind her, but it's all right there. Right. We just keep adding to it. Compose a score for you for a dollar. I felt like my girlfriend had just broken up with me, but my girlfriend was the planet Earth. Here we go. Percent. Kill Bill 2. I got to work on your crew for a bit. I composed a score for you for a dollar. Yeah, yeah. If you can ever work for Quentin for a dollar, take that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it will be a wealth of you, experience. You helped us out <laughs> tremendously. You know, he doesn't like doing the score thing. If I offer him to do it, he's just going to say no. If I do it for a dollar, he, he won't he can't say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, use it if you want. If you don't want it, throw it out. It'll be great practice for me, because yeah. I'll get the best footage in the world to make music to. <laughs> bang, bang! And I knew that the material that was going to be much more emotional and need music. You're dead, Mommy. So, die. Well, that's the only time I've actually work. really used like genuine original music where somebody was actually scoring scenes for me. But it was interesting, you know, as a director to go work for another director and sit and to see how much of the process is so inside your head. We sat in the room with, uh, with people in the music spotting. We're thinking out loud, well, maybe we can do this or well, I don't know, maybe this. You didn't really give an, a direct order, mm -hmm. but you could see you were kind of still thinking of ideas. And I was writing furiously everything you said. No one else was writing anything down. I said, after you left the room, I went, you guys got to write everything he says. He's not going to remember that he just was thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. He's going to remember it that he gave an order. 
because he actually came up with the idea right then. Mm -hmm. I know because I do that. I don't realize how, yeah. how I'm not really communicating orders sometimes. I, I kind of remember saying it in the room, but it was a what if. Mm -hmm. Three months later, when it's not there, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, where the hell is this? I asked for it. Yeah, you right. didn't <laughs> ask for it. You mentioned it as a perhaps, but yeah. you're not going to remember it as a perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I was <laughs> very, it was very much like, oh my god, now I can see why there's so much miscommunication. One, I don't give direct orders enough. Right. And two, people don't write shit down. <laughs> right, they yeah, got to write right. shit down when I'm saying that stuff. Actually, Uba uh, said the same thing when we were doing Kill Bill, walking around <laughs> with my first AD. It's like it's at the end of the day with the pizza and everything. Oh, well, yeah, maybe in the fight, then maybe they do this and do that, you know. <laughs> She's like, hey, pizza face, <laughs> put down the pizza and grab a fucking pen. He's fucking telling you what's going on. He's literally, you're telling him. <laughs> you didn't say do this, but you are. You, that was, in your re remembrance of the day, you were the, it was a direct order. And I still say that to my first AD because it's the same guy. Hey, pizza face, grab a fucking pen. <laughs> so what can you tell me about Grindhouse? Death Proof was a really thrilling experience. Ladies, that was fun! I love having my little director of photography card. Membership card. card. Yeah, that's really cool. I don't think I could really do it on any other movie that wouldn't have kind of the grindhouse label. So the photography wasn't bad, but it didn't have to be good, right. I mean, per se. You just had to do it. I used the sun. I just, I shot, I shot in the sun. I had as many sun flares as possible. <laughs> Your composition is so fantastic, though. How did you come up with your sense of you would, you know, center punching things and, and using your your aspect ratio? The way you frame is very. I remember actually trying to do Quentin framing when we did Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. There's a scene in the in the hotel room when yeah, and, and shot through the door, so like the there's the a frame, frames inside of frames and everything. And you came over and you said. That's a really interesting shot. I go, well, I'm trying to shoot like you. I would never <laughs> have thought to ever shoot this way, but I'm realizing this is probably how Quentin would shoot it because it's kind of written and it's kind to of a, be the, very the voyeuristic. More, the more Quentin-esque sequences yeah. in the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, very much. Um, how do you? How did you come up with your own visual style? Being somebody who you know wasn't a photographer. You didn't well, I wasn't a photographer. But I like, love even movies. Even still a photographer. And I love shots in movies. Mm -hmm. And you know, I love the visual quality of the films. I mean, I never seen your shots in any other movies. Yeah, your I, shots are very unique to you. Well, it's. I mean, I see the movie in my mind. Before I make the movie, I've watched the movie. I've got a genuine vision. I have a vision for the film, and I'm doing that vision. That's how I see it. I don't even think that I do anything that special. It's just literally the way I see, how you it. see it. Yeah. But it made me appreciate a, a great artist like Bob Richardson <laughs> a lot more than I did before. All right, uh, I, I appreciated him before, but... Once you had to sit there and think about like exposure and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and or uh, even like, you know, Bob doesn't have equipment in the shot. You know, like, hey, you know, there's equipment in the shot. Move it out. Well, you're the cinematographer. Where do you suppose I put the light? <laughs> I can just leave it there. We'll erase it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I can say, let's move that shit. Right, right, right. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, the reason I, I ended up shooting Grindhouse was basically just to impress Bob, all right? <laughs> uh, so he would take impressive. me a little, little more seriously on the next movie. <laughs> it's freaking impressive. I mean, the action, the, the framing, it's, 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 it's you. So I think that was what I, thrills me the most when I see mm -hmm. Death Proof is that shot going with the legs. A huge title. Yeah. Director of photography, Quinn Tarantino. <laughs> I'm just like very proud of that. No, that convinced was, you to do that. Well, I never, I never would have had the guts to do that without, you, without your, your, your faith in me. And you're it, like, oh, you'll get through it. You'll, oh, get through. So you'll be a little nervous at the beginning, but you'll get through it. I love that. <laughs> um, since I remember the audience we saw that with, that first Friday night audience, it's probably the yeah. best screening we've ever been to. Because it was the experience we always wanted. That screening was amazing. Yeah. It was the Grommets Chinese Theater filled up, sold out. The one time that happened that weekend, <laughs> all right? <laughs> the first sold show. Out. They stood in line. <laughs> yeah. Everybody hooting and hollering. We got a standing ovation for the you know for the you know the freeze frame at the end with the girls. Yeah. <laughs> We had a good Friday, actually, frankly, to tell you Friday, the truth. Yeah. Not, not just in that theater. The whole weekend was a good Friday. And that was the extent of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> they showed up, that was it. They showed up, and that was it. <laughs> but uh, I don't want anyone to get me wrong. I couldn't be prouder of Grindhouse. I couldn't be prouder of both of our films. But it was like the first one I'd had that was a flop. 
it didn't shake me as far as my feelings for the movie. It did shake me to think that I might never have a hit again. <laughs> right. Because actually when you have a big flop, you almost can't ever imagine having a hit again. They'll never show up again. Right, right, right. They got <laughs> burned once, they're not gonna come back. You know, frankly, we were also a little cocky. We had gotten used to going off into uncharted territory with you with Sin City and me with Kill Bill and hacking our way through and people following us. And we kind of thought they would follow us anywhere. And no, they won't follow you everywhere. Right, right. <laughs> There's gotta be, we, we needed to make, give them a little bit more of a reason, a little bit more of an understanding. Mm -hmm. All good. But I felt like my girlfriend had just broken up with me, but my girlfriend was the planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> What's your measure of success? Because when you have an idea, like for me, that could have easily been Sin City. When I made Sin City, mm -hmm. I thought, okay, no one's gonna get this. It's gonna go in the theater. It's black and white, it's an anthology, it's all voiceover. No one's gonna get it, they'll get it on video. Mm -hmm. But that's fine, I just wanted to make it so badly. And was surprised, actually, yeah, that people yeah. caught on. I thought they would just think it just looked weird. Well, I, I have to say, I get a big, giant kick out of the fact that, okay, we do Grindhouse, movie comes out, it doesn't do so well. And you wouldn't hear of it, man. You move right, okay, you know, like, I'm doubling down, I'm tripling down, I'm quadrupling down. Machete, machete kills. El Rey, motherfuckers, El Rey. <laughs> I can't get away from it fast enough, okay? I'm, I'm, okay, well, you know, that Inglorious Bastards, I couldn't find an end to it. I'm finding an end to it. People thought I was going through writer's block. I was, I was going through the opposite. I couldn't stop writing. Percent. Here we go. Percent. And action. Inglorious Bastards. Tell me about that. After Jackie Brown, I put Kill Bill off to the side. And I started writing Inglorious Bastards, and that became this never ending process because people thought I was going through writer's block. I was, I was going through the opposite. I couldn't stop writing. Right. I'd have a hundred page script and no end in sight. So I was trying to keep taming it, and I couldn't. Great material, you know, like that opening scene. I wrote that, that was the first thing I ever wrote. <laughs> My idea at the time, because it was just so big and so unwieldy, was to do it as a miniseries. And that really was what I was planning on doing. And uh, You'd written a lot from that. Yeah, I'd written yeah. a lot. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of writing, though, I'd have to be doing for like a six-hour miniseries. Yeah. And I'm right, I'm at the, like the day before the day, almost. Right. Where I'm getting ready to start that hard work. And Luc Besson was in town. Then we went out to dinner, me and him and his producer partner. And I'm telling him about my big miniseries, Inglorious Bastards, that I'm gonna do. And the producer guy is just like, oh yeah, Luc, that sounds awesome. That's, a, that's, that's the way to do it, Quentin. That's the way to do it. And Luc's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is French. <laughs> well, why? What? What's the matter? I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, you, you are one of the few filmmakers left out there that makes me want to leave my house <laughs> and go to a cinema and sit in the cinema and watch it on the screen. Anybody else, like, uh, I'll watch the DVD, I can see it on TV, it'd be fine, I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> but most, you know, you make me want to leave the house and go see cinema. And now you tell me I'm going to have to wait four years, <laughs> five years before I can do that again? I'm sorry, I'm not so excited. Oh, funny. And you know, every once in a while, Somebody tells you something, somebody says something to you that you can never unhear. Right. And once he said that, I couldn't unhear it. And I kept thinking about it, and I kept thinking about it, and I kept thinking about it. This is my time to do movies. Let me try one more time to make it a movie. Don't just throw up my hands and say I give up and make this incredibly sprawling epic. Let me try one more time. And that was the movie. And it was so fast. I mean, you did that very quickly, considering how, how usually yeah. your movies go, even the fast ones. That was... Well, there was, kind of was, again, I was coming off of a flop. I wanted to, I had a, you know, I, I, I had to prove myself. There's a silver line in everything. There really, there <laughs> I mean, really, it really. Oh, and it, well, it you know, but it made me want to tame myself. I wasn't quite so effing sure mm -hmm. <laughs> about myself. I had to really make this into a movie. I, I mean, I just think you were still so bold, considering that you came off of Grindhouse. 
to go in and what you did was it's a it's a bold film. I mean it's you went full on. I wouldn't be surprised if twenty years from now Inglorious Bastards is probably like the one they talk about the most. Right. Uh, I think this just might be my masterpiece. Django Unchained. Django! Django, have you always I had the idea of doing a movie where a slave becomes a bounty hunter for a long, long time. And I even had the name Django Unchained mm -hmm. for a long, long, long time. And it happened kind of completely all on its own. I was doing the press on Inglorious Bastards and been going around the world, banging the drum on that. And one of the last areas we opened up uh, theatrically, commercially, was uh, Japan. Spaghetti westerns are still really popular in Japan. They call them macaroni westerns. They uh, have almost all the soundtracks available on DVD. And I find out that there's this one soundtrack store that just specializes in nothing but soundtracks. That's my kind of store. All right? <laughs> so uh, uh, go there on my day off, buy a buttload of stuff. You know, it's like Christmas in July. So, so happy. Uh, get a little record player, go back to my hotel room, and it's my day off. I'm just listening to the soundtracks. I'm just playing all these great composers. Morricone, Riz Ortani, uh, Luis Bacalab. And then the first scene, literally what's in the movie, the first scene of Django comes to me. He's on the chain gang, slaves walking in unison. It's cold, breath. And then Schultz, just showing up in the distance with his lantern, and then the whole scene happens. Who's that stumbling around in the dark? I'm Dr. King Schultz. This is my horse, Fritz. And the next thing I know, I'm writing it. And I don't even have my notebook or my crap with me. I'm just like using the, the, the hotel stationery. And in just this fevered thing, mm -hmm. I write out that first scene. I just get the characters talking to each other. They do the whole thing, boom. What's your name? Django. Then you're exactly the one I'm looking for. Felt like it was like, you know, similar to the Inglorious Bastard scene. Well, now I've got to do it. Yeah. This is a great way to open a movie. When did it start that you would use scores from other movies? Here we go, for set. So for music, when did it start that you would use scores from other movies? It all started on Jackie Brown. Harvey Weinstein was like, ah, there's not enough music in it. I think you really need to hire put a score. I think you need to hire a lot. It's too late, Harvey. We've just gone too far. I'm not going to hire some guy that I could write a score in the next four days. That's not how I'm going to do a movie, you know, the first time I work with a composer. Yeah. He goes, well, isn't there some old movie that you like that you could just like, use the score that already exists? I guess I could do that. I mean, that's not such a dumb idea. Can I do that? Well, yeah, I guess if I license it, I can do anything I want. Well, that's a whole different proposition because that's now I'm not waiting for some guy to yeah. show up and, you know, and, and Hope you like it. deliver me the soul of my movie and I better like it. That's just like me using the other songs. I just choosing. Well, so happens. I had Roy Ayers' uh, soundtrack to Coffee. I had that record. And, you know, it was a nice uh, symbiotic relationship with the whole Pam Greer connection. So uh, I just used uh, the coffee score all throughout the movie. Just if he didn't write it, I didn't use it. And it worked out really good. You know, when you know the music beforehand, you're going to use. It's not an afterthought. You're like orchestrating. Yeah, you can orchestrate the shots and the cutting so they really go hand in hand. I remember I was using Street Life in yeah. you know, that song, Street Life, when Jackie Brown comes into the thing. Well, I know I'm using Street Life, so I could actually set the shots up so I know, okay, at when the, you know, when the symbols do this, this is going to happen. And then she walks out of frame, and we're going to pick her up as the drums do this. When you know on the day this piece of music you're using, you can get even more clever with it. Yeah, because you you almost like pre-scoring the movie. Right, I thought, well, I don't see any reason to change. I like doing it this way. When I heard your use of... Uh... Sam Fear and the Pan Flute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Jerry Goldsmith's Under Fire. Yeah, yeah. It's never been used better, even in Under Fire. That's <laughs> 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 the way you used it in Django. <laughs> it's fantastic. I've been waiting for years. That's always been one of my actually favorite soundtracks. And that's my favorite Jerry Goldsmith soundtrack. And that's saying a hell of a lot. And I refuse to shorten it too. Yeah, because if you shorten it, it builds so wonderfully that you're able to put it in the movie and use it the correct way to really build that. That's what I really loved about it. I kept waiting for the edit. Yeah. Because I know that piece really well. Right, yeah. And it's like he's gonna have to cut it mm -hmm. and you don't. And it's yeah. and it's so cathartic. And everyone kept talking about, well, we need to shorten it down, you know, because you know, it's a big long movie, they need to shorten it down. And then from time to time people would talk about, well, what about that trip to Candyland? Do we does it need to be so long? And <laughs> I never said no, 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 but I just would never take anything out of there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> On September 28th, 1993, I visited the set of Pulp Fiction. It was the day that you were playing Jimmy. You are in yeah. your robe. But um, Sonny Chiba was there that day, too. And I remember you having lunch with him and, um, and telling him, we're going to do something together. We're going to do something together. And I remember looking at Sonny and just going, I got to meet him and, and just thinking, wow, I wonder what Quentin, if Quentin will ever get the chance to make something for him. He weren't paying him lip service. He worked with him later um, and made him a, a great part in Kill Bill. In, in your mind, so do you catalog some actors that you've always wanted to work with that you still would love to work with? And how do you keep track of some of these people? There's all these different actors that I grew up watching and loving and appreciating. And, you know, there's big actors I wanted to work with, but there's also people that I thought, you know, uh, should be showcased more in American movies, like somebody like Sonny Chiba, or actors that I've always liked, like Robert Forrester or Michael Park. So I thought, should have done better. Then I could give them an opportunity to give them a cool kind of scene that's not what they're used to doing now. And finding that little light in their eyes. One of my favorite quotes you gave me on directing was, sometimes being a good director is just being a good audience. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what pieces of advice would you give a filmmaker on how to work with actors? One, don't be intimidated by your actors. Don't be scared. You're there to find it together. But I actually think one of the best things that a, a, a film director today can do for an actor is not be stuck in Video Village. Mm -hmm. Not be watching it on a monitor, not be watching it on a TV set, sitting in a chair, oftentimes in a whole other room. <laughs> Right, right. Than where the scene's taking place. I mean, that's a fairly new phenomenon, mm -hmm. and it's completely taken over. Yeah. And uh, I mean, so much so that I really wouldn't want to be starting all over again as an actor with the directors watching my work from another room. Hey, do this. No, do, do it camera left. Could you tell him to go and do a camera right, left? Right, right. I think you should be sitting right by the camera. Action. If you watch the acting, right next to the camera, right in front of the actors. It's as if they are acting just and solely and utterly only for you. The rest of the crew doesn't matter. The audience later in the theater doesn't matter. It's a million miles away. Maybe it will never happen. They are acting only for you. When you're standing there by the camera and they've all acted in front of you, when you say cut, Cut. They all turn and look at you. What do you think? Now that's what I'm talking about. Let's do one more like that. That was a great one. one more. Cool. So this is a segment in the show called uh, Questions from Other Directors. Here we go. For sec. Here we go. For sec. And action. So this is a segment in the show called uh, Questions from Other Directors, where I put a call out to other directors to ask you questions. Joe Dante has a question for you. What's the most takes you've ever done on a movie? It was an effect take I was trying to do in Kill Bill. She's fighting the crazy 88, and we were doing it the old-fashioned way, the shang Shei way. You take a Chinese condom, and you fill it full of the phony blood, and the actors just have it in their hand. And so when you slice the sword, the actor like squeezes the Chinese condom and the blood explodes and it looks awesome. So the effect I was trying to do is the camera is, is like, like, like an over the shoulder behind one of the female crazy 88. And Uma has got her sword like slashing like her throat. And what the girl's supposed to do is she's got the condom full of blood in her hand and she's supposed to clutch at her throat as she squeezes the condom. And so you never saw the throat slash itself because the camera was behind the girl's head. 
But after Uma does it and she grabs her throat, you, you're gonna see like the blood go. <laughs> Every time we did it, the blood went down. Oh, I see. It never went that <laughs> way. And so we kept doing it again, kept doing it again. Take 22, take 23. We've changed her clothes three different times. Right. So now she's off for the fourth change. And I'm walking by myself, one of those dark moments of the soul. <laughs> Do I commit, say failure and move on? Uh, or if I don't, how long is it gonna take? And, you know, and how far am I prepared to, to triple down right. on it? And I swear, it was as if Shang Shea came to me and he said, Quentin, hang in there. You have no idea how long it takes. This is very difficult. It's going to happen, though. It has to happen one way or the it, it's, it's, it, it, You're due. It's going to go up at some point. <laughs> you can't quit. Hang in there. Do it six more times. See what happens. And then, like you know, uh, you know, maybe the fifth time or so, then it finally did it the right way. <laughs> so a good thirty takes. It was probably a thirty-four. <laughs> wow. Um, when are you going? Jackie Chan still has me beat though in Dragon Lord. That hacky sack thing was a thousand takes. That was the most takes ever done. Guillermo del Toro has a question for you. Who, in your opinion, is the ultimate badass actor of all time? There's a lot of guys you could say, but I have to say, right now, I'm, I'm in particularly, right now, over the last few years, I've been on a real Lee Van Cleef kick. I mean, I really wish I could have worked with Lee Van Cleef in that, like, 69, 70 time period. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, you know. Lee Van Cleef is a dead ringer for Snoop Dogg. <laughs> they look exactly alike. I mean, as if they are the same guy. <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola asked him for a question for you. He said, even though all of your films, of course, reveal very much about you, would you ever consider making a film that depicts more about your own life, feelings, and times without that almost protective layer of genre? Would you ever think about doing that? I would think about doing that, but at the same time, though, um, I like that protective layer of genre. At the same time, I do know what he means, and I know where he's coming from, and I know the journey he's been on. That was part of his thing. I remember him thinking, you know, uh, I want to see people make a movie about, like, you know, no one makes a movie about how they feel about their brother. Right. And that could be a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of things that you would imagine, you know, little novels right. being based on. And that's where he's going with it, and I think that's where he's going with that question. And um, right now, I really like taking my story, what I have to say, my tale, my little autobiographies, but sticking them in crazy genre worlds and having it reflect that way. Maybe when I get older, then I will be like, no, let's do with this on the surface. This is about a guy in love, or this is about a guy who doesn't know what he wants to do, or this is about a guy who feels he's failed, or this is about a guy who didn't have kids and wishes he had kids now. I mean, maybe I want to tell that story uh, later, but I don't want to tell it now. Now I want to, now I want to be completely tell you the truth and be completely personal, but inside of a genre. I mean, Kill Bill was insanely personal. I don't necessarily want you to know why it's so damn personal and why it was like ripped from my heart and my soul. I want to create a little subterfuge, all right? So, you know, it's not just uh, the story of a Squint and Farantino filmmaker <laughs> and this is what's happening in his life, all right? So I bury it inside of a bunch of other stuff. But it's still all very real, and it's still coming from me. But there's a, like another question that's sort of like that. That's like, a, well, when are you ever going to do a comedy? What the hell are you talking about? All my movies are really funny. I'll put my comedies against anybody's out there, laugh for laugh. Yeah, yeah, but you know, but when are you going to just do a full bore, straight up comedy? You mean like Pulp Fiction? which belongs in the comedy section. I mean, there's not really a dramatic moment in Pulp Fiction. Bring out the gimp. Like, they're a little dramatic, but they're more outrageous. And I still think they're funny anyway. I think people, when they talk about comedy, they have a very narrow view right. of comedy. And I'm trying to expand that view. This is what you get for fucking around with Yakuza's! Go home to your mother! But then you get somebody saying, okay, I guess what we're trying to say is, 
Are you, will you ever do a comedy without violence? What you flinching? You mean like the Three Stooges? All right. Because <laughs> slapstick is violence. All right. Well, no, I'll keep more uh, 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 social commentary. Django isn't a slave. Django is a free man, you understand? You won't, I should treat him like white folks? No. Okay, would you ever do like a Billy Wilder like comedy? Billy Wilder, you mean like Some Like It Hot, which has two different machine gun massacres in it? <laughs> Violence doesn't make it any less funny. Maybe in somebody else's hands it does, but not for me. <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich, one of my all time favorite filmmakers. As a question for you, who has been the greatest influence in your work? You know, at the end of the day, I think the the one artist that I think is the most influential to me as uh, in my work has got to be Sergio Leone. That kind of half-assed operatic quality that he brought, and the way the music takes over and kind of set pieces, directing via set piece a lot of times. I think he is the filmmaker that you can spot the most in my work. You know, that kind of operatic quality I'm trying to bring. Edgar Wright, how does it feel to have a style that audiences and critics can identify, and how important is it to create a body or work that is uniquely you? It feels magnificent. I wouldn't want it any other way. To be able to work in this art form at a level of a genuine artist. And your filmography is not a hit or miss thing. You have a vision. Tell him fuck you to fuck him. You. And then throw it to everybody all around you. You have a voice. Do you have a sound? And each new film is your new conversation. And each new film is what you have to add to the conversation. Kill the Nazis. And to actually have it be recognized. But not just by critics and not just by your fans, but by the world. The Palm Door. For original screenplay. And the Oscar goes to Quentin Tarantino. Mr. Tarantino. <laughs> That's playing the game at the highest level. That's Bobby Fischer chess. And everyone else is fucking around with checkers. Come on, let's do it one more time. Why? Because we love making movies. You're an inspiration to us all. You're a dear friend of mine and the El Rey Network. <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> pleased, very pleased to have you here with us today on the director's chair. Thank you, Seymour. It's my pleasure, mate. Thanks a bunch. Thanks, guys.